Welcome to the New Deutsche Welle podcast. Uh, this is episode three. This week we're going to be continuing our discussion on the opening the energy gates Qigong set. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how this relates to Yichun and uh, fighting arts, as well as continue the discussion of the alignments and some of the pieces about how to go inside to do the dissolving. Just a couple things. Uh, we now have a Facebook page, um, and I'm going to be teaching a Energy Gates workshop on February 8th, 2020. Uh, if you're interested in either of those, I'll put links to them on the description, or you can check out our website, www.watertradition.com. Thanks for listening, and on to the episode. <laughs> from where we left off. Um, it mentions, in an odyssey that through various martial arts lasting more than two decades, his ambition was always to study with a lineage grandmaster. Um, meaning that, you know, in Chinese martial arts, you know, one of the goals traditionally is to find your teacher's teacher or to find the source sort of roots of the style. In Chinese martial arts, a lot of times, the more authentic, the more old-fashioned, the more traditional you are, the better. And I think, you know, from what I've heard from him, he always was seeking... The oldest or the most purest or the most, uh, you know, accomplished uh, older masters he could find when he was going into, you know, learn Chinese martial arts. And uh, we talked a little bit about his uh, teacher in Japan, Cho Sensei. He trained in the park and learned a lot of exercises from that relate to opening the energy gates. And I, uh, in this article from Fighting Arts, uh, Fighting Arts International from the 80s, um, he mentions another of the teachers he met in Japan. Um, he was practicing Tai Chi and Xing Yi up to six hours a day that he had learned from Chang Yi Zhang, otherwise known as Cho Sensei. Also that year, I was introduced to and began studying with Kenichi Sawai, a Xing Yi teacher and friend of Wang Shujin. Wang Shujin, the famous uh, internal martial arts teacher in Taiwan. Uh, both had studied under Wang Shang Sai, a famous Xing Yi teacher in Beijing. Kenichi Sawai was a very practical fighter, and many of his students developed his sort of chi. With Kenichi Suai, we practice a lot of the standing postures of Da Cheng Chuan, also known as Yi Chuan. In many Tai Chi schools in the West, this practice is considered to be a pre-Tai Chi exercise, but in fact, it has roots in Xing Yi practice. The normal method is to stand with your arms out in a circle in front of you with the knees bent in a posture that is variously called holding a large jug, standing like a stake, the universal post, and standing Qigong, and so on. So why had us practice these standing postures two hours at a time in a class with no movement? Um... So when I hear that quote, I'm thinking that's at the root of opening the energy gates. Opening the energy gate starts with the standing posture where you do standing Qigong. And that sounds a lot like what he was doing with Kenichi Suai. And I know that when you and I especially started practicing together, we spent a lot of time standing. And standing being one of the most important parts of Kumar's system. Yeah, you I think it's the, you know, it's the core of his whole system is the standing. Now, I think there's a difference between the energy gate standing and the if you will, the each man standing that he did with those guys more more emphasis on martial arts. So, you know, you're standing with your arms up in the air for the most part, as opposed to down by your side, and you're squatting a little lower than you would in the the, the energy gate standing. But the purpose of it is essentially the same, which is to integrate your body, integrate your body, yeah, through standing, yeah, because that's the main. Like he would always say, you know, the main thing that. Wang Shijing emphasized was, was getting everything to gel was the quote and they would say like that you're trying to get everything to like become sort of unified so by standing your whole body energy even your mind becomes more unified yeah, that's yeah and so that that you know as a starting off point for doing Tai Chi that's a pretty good place to start and then like you know you said it's it, it's also can be its own art with internal practice so when you started when did you start doing the standing training uh, well, so he teaches standing in energy gates and in spiraling energy body. So I think 93 or 94, I did a spiraling energy body class. And that was the first time I did any standing with my arms in the air. Um, and those are more specialized postures. They're not the same ones you use in each end, but, you know, same concept. You're just holding a posture and doing a lot of the same stuff you do in energy aids, but, um, you know, with your eyes open and with your arms up in the air. 
And so when you do, when, uh, you know, so the standing posture that forms the basis of opening the energy gates is sort of a quiet standing. You don't move your arms, you don't move your legs, everything just hangs and softens. And like we were talking about last episode, the top of your head rises and your lower spine stretches downward. Yeah, and I think, you know, the, the piece that he emphasized more in the early days was just, you know, just stand there. Don't have any agenda or try to do a bunch of stuff, but just to stand there and feel the posture and, like, as just a physical awareness thing of, of am I, you know, where am I in relationship to my body kind of thing. Um, before you even got into doing things like dissolving or, you know, it was just, it was much more about like, just stand there and use the process of standing as a way of accessing your body. So in a way, a lot of complicated instructions actually probably don't matter as much, especially at first. Yeah. I mean, clearly he always emphasized that, you know, without putting in the hours, you know, standing was really not. You know, you had the main thing was you just had to do it and do it a bunch. And if you did it a bunch, you know, you wouldn't need to ask why you did it. It was just kind of, it was sort of, and I think it's the same with dissolving that, you know, in the beginning when you dissolve, there's a lot of, um, doubt, you know, am I doing it right? What am I supposed to be feeling? Is this dissolving or am I just making it up in my head? And then after a while, you just kind of develop a sense of, you know, trust in yourself and your abilities. And so you start to not have, you know, it's not like you're looking for something. You just are accessing it. You know what it is. And so once you know what it is, you know, it's easier to do it. And so I think a lot of the standing stuff is just stand there until you know what it is. And what if you don't know what it is? Uh, Bruce would always say, "If you, you know, when it wakes up, you'll know. You know, when you, when you, when your head can talk to your tailbone, an awareness of your body is one thing as opposed to a bunch of little things. Mm. So the, you know, opening the energy gates, right? Well, what are the the gates for? The gates are, you know, what, they, what do gates do? They connect one part to another part to another part. You know, so if, it's just like." <clears throat> Once all those little gates are open, instead of being a bunch of little parts, it's one big thing. And, you know, quote unquote, the spiraling energy body, right? So you create this, you know, thing by letting go of these separations. And I think that's the the piece about unification is it's just, it's more about letting go of what you're holding on to than it is about to make something happen. To me, that recalls one of the things he says in the books in various places that, you know, it's not like you're trying to build a skyscraper. It's more like you're trying to uncover the hidden treasure that's already within your system. All these energy gates are there. All the spiraling connections are already there. It's a question of experiencing them. Yeah, I mean, I think the only part that you're, if you want to talk about creating something, is that's the physical strength, right? which is a really small part of the training. But, if, you know, if you don't have the physical strength to stand on one leg, it's kind of hard to do cloud hands. True. But by doing cloud hands, you gain the strength to stand on one leg right. eventually. And it doesn't take a whole lot of strength to stand on one leg. And, and there are other things you can do if you need to get strong enough to do it. But, like, you know, if you walk, you can do energy gates, basically. So it's, it's a pretty low bar as far as, like, physical abilities. Um, but there is some, you know, physical structure stuff but beyond that it's mostly about connections you know feeling so returning to this article um so why had us practice the standing postures two hours at a time in class with no movement sometimes he had us practicing an hour on each leg in single leg stances it is considered easier to move the chi with the mind when you are static than when you are moving as the mind has a lot less input to be concerned with well i think this is the component of you know, standing is a container for dissolving, right? And in, in energy gates, and but so is cloud hands, right? So that you can you can carry over the skill of dissolving from standing to cl- or breathing or any internal skill. You can carry that over into a physical thing. So, I think the reason for starting with standing is it's easier to, you know, it's easier to. F- focus on one thing to feel 
or to breathe or you know whatever the one thing is if you're not also trying to balance your body and do a physical movement you know so like, that's just where like not always about better it's sometimes more about like more efficient so that's that sense again of you know you're building up your training but the the way to build up is to let go and you know stop take away the things that are preventing your body from being unified you're not forcing it into shape you are taking away the conditions that are leaving you disunified i think especially that's what makes you know, the, the, the quote water method is that you're 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 not trying to make something happen you're allowing yourself to feel what's happening you know and then to so sort of harness that feeling so by by feeling your body as sort of a unified whole now you're enhancing its ability to be unified right and then it's this sort of chicken and egg thing of you know the ability to relax makes you more unified the ability to be more unified makes it easier to relax you know so that that's a loop so another thing he says about the training in Kenichi Suwai's class uh, there was a lot of sparring and fighting all the training took place outside no matter what the weather was like we even practiced in the pouring rain if you slipped up you got injured a broken jaw cracked ribs or worse um, you know, and that's, that sounds like some pretty rough times, but how does something as simple as standing translate to, you know, sparring? Well, I think in, in that sense, it can be used as a healing, you know, a recovery thing. Mm -hmm. So the, the damage you take from sparring doesn't last as long if you stand and, you know, do some dissolving afterward. But I also, you know, like think that was... That's a different kind of training. You know, most people nowadays aren't aren't training that, you know, that hard. So, you know, they don't need to put the, as much time into the fixing broken bones and stuff. <laughs> I mean, yeah, 1960s Japan. I mean, I do think there's something about practicing in the weather because when you and I used to get together, we'd go up on Tank Hill in San Francisco where... I, I'm pretty sure Cho's... Uh, classes were on a rooftop I think yeah that, i mean it says here it was outside and I we think, i think in marnix's in one of marnix's uh, uh articles he talks about how when you know bruce introduced him to show that they practiced on a rooftop or something hmm. in japan that yeah. sounds likely and that, in cold. the corn rain yeah <laughs> and cold and windy. but yeah tank hill was the same kind of thing i mean i think there's without yeah. the broken bones yeah, there's there's elemental, you know, training is good. Being out in the outdoors is, is helpful. I think it makes you feel your body a little more. I mean, I think, you know, we got a lot out of standing out in the cold, in the rain, in the wind. And I think yeah. part of that is you want to have yourself nice and bundled up when you do that sure. so that you're not too uncomfortable. But there's something about the ex those external forces, uh, you know, it really, I feel like I got more out of it when we dealt with mosquitoes and you know, whipping winds and stuff like that. Like, I don't necessarily feel like I want to do that all the time, but you know, the times I've done it, I'm glad I did afterward. I think it's the difference between running on a treadmill and running through a canyon, you know. It's just, it's the same activity, but the setting matters, you know. And, and that's why I like, you know, Bruce's old retreats used to always be, and the Anvil Ranch ones were, you know, out in the woods. And so you got the sort of immersion of, you know, if you're doing something like energy, it's where for like, you might for two or three days do nothing but stand, you know? Right. And just like you're nothing but standing and dissolving for two or three days. And it's like when you sort of eat, sleep and breathe that it starts to have like a snowball effect and, you know, you get deeper into it. So that's why I think the, you know, daily practice is important. And, you know, the thing Bruce said about, like, I think it was Joe that told him, you know, the, the if, you know, essentially, if you start slow, don't push yourself and practice every day, you'll get further at it than if you, you know, try to practice really hard once a week. Right. You know, and I think that, you know, we've always stuck to the, you know, five minutes a day rule that, you know, if you just do a little bit, it's like you won't get better but you won't get worse. You know? <laughs> and I think that's kind of the, the bare minimum, but, you know, start there and work your way up to 
You know, Bruce would always talk about when you first start learning standing, you don't start by trying to set a timer for 20 minutes and force yourself to stand for 20 minutes. You do it for like two minutes and then see how you feel. And then, you know, every day you add 30 seconds or something like that, you know, um, that, that way you're not pushing your system. And I think that, that piece was sort of what, uh, he would always emphasize in terms of safety, you know, that you're, especially if you're practicing by yourself, you know, you don't want to hurt yourself. So it's, it's a kind of good way to put some boundaries on it. So just to finish this article, uh, both Zhang Yijong and Kenichi Suai stress that if you try to go beyond what you really know, that before you, you learn a movement, before you fully grasp the movement before, that could become a permanent learned weakness or fault. And that, to me, you know, when it comes to energy gates, there's a few movements repeated over and over that are hard to get too wrong. And so it enables you to have something that you can lay down a foundation for more complex movements that come later. So something as simple as standing becomes that fully grasped. It feels like a nice foundation before you are taking on a lot more difficult movements. It's, yeah, it's your frame of reference for everything else, right? So you get the... Especially if you do the, the one-legged standing stuff because then you have, you know, a frame of reference for your left side, your right side, and standing on both feet. And then, you you know, everything you do in Tai Chi or whatever, you know, you're going to be in one of those positions. You know, you're going to be on your left foot, both feet, or your right foot. And, and that, you know, if you have a standing thing to relate it to you can say well if I feel sort of like I do when I stand I know I'm relatively you know close to being aligned right so you, but if you don't have that frame of reference you just kind of do it and if it doesn't hurt you think it's fine but you know the, the especially the piece about just keeping the spine straight because that's something that when you start moving even just doing simple movements like shifting your weight the, the, you know, the variables change and it's, you know, hard to maintain. So, like, I think that why you spend so much time doing it standing is just then it's like, you know, wired into your system, as Bruce used to say. Hmm. So everything you do, you know, everything you do standing, you're going to then do moving, right? So you have to, like, get it in your body. And that that's the piece, I think, that you, know, you would emphasizes that you, know, you don't move you don't work on the next piece until you have that one in your body so that you know the the phrase he liked was separate and combine you know mm -hmm. you do one piece until you have that piece then you do another piece until you have that piece and then you do the, the two pieces until you can do those two pieces together so as a single piece as right? a single piece right and then you know add another one so that philosophy definitely pervades the whole opening the energy gate sets of taking your time, working on each piece carefully. I think another thing that you and I have both hit on in the past is you don't want to let that f hold you back. In other words, you don't want to be afraid to try a new exercise or movement just because you haven't mastered the other ones. You're never going to really master them. Whoa. All these things are going to, you're going to keep working on these for years to come. But hey, if you, you shouldn't be afraid to try, to try an exercise and check it out and about, see how it feels. I don't think it's about being... Uh, doing it perfectly or mastering it, it's about being comfortable, right? So mm. if, even if you, you know, if you do movement A, you know, okay, and movement B poorly, when you get to the point where movement B is okay, then you can move, do movement C. Like, they right. don't, they don't all have to be it. perfect before you can add, you know, you never go anywhere. That's right. Some people fall in that trap, I feel like, of, you right. know, our school says to take it easy and... The you, I'm not ready thing. The I'm not ready trap, right? No, and, and you have to recognize that even if you aren't ready for something, that doesn't mean you can't be exposed to it. It just means that you can be exposed to it and then recognize that, you know, you're not going to do it for a while. Mm -hmm. And there were, you know, there are a lot of things that I learned early on that I thought, okay, this is, you know, file this away for later, you know, when when it's appropriate and, you know. You just have to, you know, use some common sense as a foot, you know. So if someone says, yeah, you can turn your hips to 90 degrees when you do the first swing, uh, but you can't turn your hips more than 10 degrees, you know, 
that doesn't matter that it's possible that, that, that you just do what you can do and you know you work up you don't try to push yourself to what's you know the, the extreme i think that you know what matters is seeing how it feels to you and staying focused instead of looking how <laughs> someone else looks be as focused on how you yourself feel because that's going to help you find your way to making your movement more healthy and hearty you know yeah and and the the just recognize that if what you're feeling is tension or you know something other than relaxation so that's where the dissolving comes in right the the anything that's you know strong or weak or you know that that whole rap that you know about as, as you feel stuff anything that you're feeling that doesn't feel quite right you you dissolve and, and that you know that carries over into the whole thing so that's that comfort thing about you know if if you can you know if you feel like you can bounce a little bit in your body and you feel comfortable then you know you may not be doing it perfectly but you're not doing you're not hurting yourself and that's i think the most important piece definitely it's, like it's comfortable so going from there further on into the book uh we left off uh looking at the alignments of standing um, the next one we were came to was uh, the eyes and the tongue. Right. Beginners practice with the eyes shut, tongue touches the roof of the mouth. Right. In standing, your eyes should be kept initially closed to facilitate your going inwards. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, the eyes closed is sort of more the, you know, you can do... You can do the hands down stuff, you know, hands at your side, the energy gate stuff with your eyes closed once you start doing things with your arms up in the air it, it makes more sense to do it with your eyes open so you know uh, in the beginning it's do what's easiest you know because it is a lot easier to go inside quote unquote and feel the inside of your body if you're not being distracted by what's happening around you so what is what when you use the phrase to go inside when you're standing what does that mean? You know, what do you think that means? Well, I mean, you can take it from a literal sense in terms of just feel the layers of skin to bone, you know, and, and feeling just in layers of physical stuff, flesh, bone, organs, that stuff into your body. But it also is a sense of, and I think this is more what the dissolving is about, is about quieting your mind and letting... You know, if you will, that that sense of soaking like water into you know, wood or something, where you just seep into it, and that allows you to, you know, contact it with your intent a little easier. So the the purpose of standing, in a sense, is to join those two things: the the physical sensations you're feeling, and the internal sort of ability to scan your body or feel it, right? So that, that what you're feeling is at least a fairly good representation of what you're actually doing and it's not being distorted by your tension or, you know, your preconceived notions. Of so an example of that could be, say, you think you're standing straight, then you look in a mirror and you realize one of your shoulders is way up. Sure. Or a really common one is people lean lean back or lean forward a little bit and they don't realize it because you know they're adjusting their body to for maybe their neck is sticking forward or something so they lean back to you know and so you, that's where you need a partner or better yet a teacher to to tell you you know okay this is where you need to be and then you know after a few times of being corrected you kind of get you know a frame of reference and you, know, you can improve on you start bridging that gap between how you you think you're feeling you you right. are standing, and then feeling the actual right the, position the, you're the in. difference between the mental image in your head and what's actually happening. You know? The Bruce talked about that a lot about that you know you'll create images in your head of what you think you're supposed to do or s supposed to feel, where the reality is when you actually feel the thing, it's nothing like what you thought it was going to feel like. <laughs> So, you know, people have this image of what dissolving is going to feel like before they actually can do it. And then you can do it and you're like, oh, that's not what I thought it was going to be like. It's still great, but it's not the same. It's not what you expected. In a sense. So, you know, I uh, yeah, I think you're right in the there's that feeling that 
you know, what you, uh, what you're telling yourself is happening may not be what you're actually experiencing. So when you do some standing, I think you naturally find your way to pare away some of those thoughts and feelings. You start to well, recognize a lot of those sensations are just randomly flowing through your mind. Why when you starts, stand there a while, why he starts you can start to the, shed that. Why he starts with the eyes is because that's one of those things you can, you can feel if you're bugging your eyes out of your head. Right? And so it's a, it's a physical thing. You can kind of go, okay, well, I can relax my eyes. And, it, and it's a bit like changing the tone of your voice, that it, it just a, a subtle shift like that does make a difference. And so, you know, if you do something like that to start off with, it kind of helps bring you into that space of dissolving. So, like, the thing he would frequently have you know, do is just, you know, the, the top of the head. You just sit there and feel the top of the head for a few minutes because just the process of, like, gathering your attention and doing that bit of it you know it's just a big you know that's that's like getting the car started and then you know you go for a drive so so the act of gathering your attention somewhere in your body strengthens that attention it exercises that attention it helps you build up the ability to pay attention and with your eyes closed you start paying attention to things on the inside right like i mean you could do it with your feet too it's just a little bit harder you know like but in like bagua you frequently do you know eyes and feet and stuff like that right where you're trying to become aware of these you know places in your body because it's just about maintaining awareness of top and bottom um so the next thing here it says the tongue should be kept touching the roof of the mouth during all qigong practices um, he mentions microcosmic circulation as the reason. Uh, I had a past teacher say it helps you so you don't, when you get punched, you don't bite on your tongue. That's a good one. I, I mean, it also one helps, helps keep, you from, keep, keep you from getting your mouth getting dry. Hmm. So like, you, you're, you know, if you're breathing, breathing through the nose. Yeah, if you're breathing through your mouth, you, there's a tendency for your mouth to get dry, so. So keep the mouth shut, tip of the tongue held against the roof. Mm -hmm. Um. And that's where major yang and yin energies of the body meet. Right, it's the, the loop from top to bottom or back to front. And so do you put that like right behind your teeth or further back up sort of at the top of the mouth? Yeah, it's right sort of the top of your palate. I mean, Bruce always you just make this sort of uh, sound. Uh, and then it's where your tongue, uh, where your tongue lands. Okay, so that's not too far back. No. And it's not, I don't think it, you know, at least in the beginning, it's not going to matter if it's a little bit off. So a lot of these energy gates don't necessarily have to be acupuncture precise. You're kind of getting the gist of alignments and connections, and they tend to sort of magnetize to each other. They don't have to necessarily be perfect. Yeah, and I don't think they exist exactly in one spot. I mean, they're, you know, like acupuncture points, they, they have a general position, but, you know, it might be a little bit to the side or depending on the, you know, person's makeup. So, you know, like, they, the the points and energy gates, I think, are even more, you know, amorphous. But they exist on multiple levels, too. So, like, you know, when, you, when you're talking about energy gates, you're mostly just talking about the ones on the surface hmm. as opposed to the ones outside the body or deeper in, you know. So that brings me to the end of this uh, section on the eyes and tongue. Another volume in this series, The Spiraling Energy Body, will present advanced practices that enable people with their eyes open to dissolve the influence of external stimuli yet in the same released. way that they clear out energy blockages internally. Yeah, the yet-to-be-released spiraling energy body. Yeah, well, that's the next stage is after you can dissolve yourself, you then move into dissolving outside of your and into, into your other energy bodies. Interesting. Which is very not interesting. part of it. Well, I think that brings us to the conclusion of today's right. discussion. Nice talking to you, bro. Cheers. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, please like and subscribe. Um, one more thing. Uh, our good friend Frank Allen has a documentary now out on Amazon Prime. It's called Tai Chi Club. You should check it out. Shows some good f uh, footage of Frank in the old days, and it's really a uh, great uh, piece of the history. Thanks.